This is a time of year people are most likely to get the flu. But today the state's hospitals started preparing for something much worse, an influenza pandemic. For the next week, staff like doctors and nurses at John Hunter Hospital will be checking whether they can handle a mass outbreak, something health experts say is going to happen sooner rather than later. What we're doing is we're testing 36 emergency departments across Hunter New England Area Health to see how well we can cope with presentations, people presenting with influenza. It's been more than 40 years since the last major influenza outbreak and the Area Health Service isn't wasting any time preparing for the next. We have to make sure that our emergency services are always light up to speed and our emergency departments are uh, at a level where they can triage and make sure they identify these patients at very short notice. As part of the drill, emergency departments will be presented with large numbers of patients pretending to have symptoms of pandemic flu to see whether they can cope with a sudden influx of sick people. We're confident that this area health service uh, will serve the public very well and will be very, very well prepared should, uh, should there be an incident. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. Showing rabbits is a tradition that dates back to the 1800s, when the idea was to exhibit the most virile and healthy animal that a stockman could produce. More than a century later, little has changed. In a modest community hall between Newcastle and the Central Coast, 500 bunnies are waiting for their turn to shine at the Rabbit Nationals. Polish join Rexes, Satins, Swiss Foxes, Tans, Dutch, English Spot, Harlequins, just to name a few. These are specific line bred rabbits that we're breeding for the show table, so everybody is aiming to get the best show rabbit on the day. It's extremely serious business. The Exhibitors and Breeder Society has flown in a judge from the UK. I judge all over England, uh, or British Isles, every, every weekend virtually, yeah. I judge 40 plus shows a year. And he likes what he sees. Turns out these bunnies have their ears, eyes, legs, tails, spots and stripes in all the right places. The best ones could compete anywhere. Take Muffy, for example. She's already fluffy, but her owner Louise ensures she's at her most puffy. Angoras actually have a wool coat, and it can get mighty hot under there. Competition aside, you can tell there's a lot of love for these pets. Many come when called and are toilet trained. Well, I've had people ring me and say, that, is it OK if my rabbit swims in the pool? You know, because the rabbit's jumped in the pool and swimming around with the kids. And they're, they're great. They're, they're just like a cat or dog. The rabbits that they have here today cost anywhere from around $40 to $100. It's about $4 to feed a rabbit a week, so in the scheme of things, they make quite a cheap family pet. It's definitely not a money-making mission, no, definitely not. It's, it's it's for the love of the bunnies, yeah. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. With the likes of Adam Griffiths and Jade North off contract after this season, the need to secure their services gets more urgent by the day. Gold Coast and Townsville can approach players after uh, the end of this month, so we need to ensure that we've got uh, our players signed up, which we you know, 100% want to keep. There's no doubt long-term contracts are on the Jets' agenda this week as Newcastle moves to keep Joel Griffiths here for another four years. We've had four different uh, marquee players here and, and of the four marquee players here, I would suggest uh, Joel's been more influential and more effective than all of them. Should both parties agree to terms, being marquee means the money he was on could be used to keep others like Ante Kovic. Kept busy against Queensland, the towering gloveman helped get defender Daniel Piakovsky out of trouble early, every bit the guiding hand. Yeah, half time, so I said, take it easy, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself and um, I suppose if you're in trouble you can always go along. The defender made up for it later though, well and truly in the mix in that messy goal, copping a knock to the head after action which his coach called brave. As for who actually scored it... And Giles claims it, I think, on the... The pretense, the fact that he he could actually say it was my goal, where poor old Zua was running out round uh, with his hands in the air. The import yet to find his goal-scoring groove. And got the lights and away we go. Not a brilliant start. Benjamin. Benjamin gets the start. Oh, yes. 
Hello, Aussie, and this is a big day. Oh, no, Pete! That what was, was that? That was tight and twisty nature, especially of this set. Rock! Nice move. Gets it parked in the middle of the corner, only runs a little bit. Eight points in the championship, and he's 11 behind Pitt now as we head to Magny Cor in France. It's been a day about two Brits, and Harms still under pressure as he comes across the line, but does make it. Harms takes sixth place. Given the option to ship her racing chair home from the Paralympics, Christy Dawes wouldn't be without it a day, let alone six weeks. It came back with her on the flight, an indication this partnership will go beyond Beijing. I really love this sport and I do it because I love it and I can't imagine just finishing these games and cutting it out forever. That's it's just not me. You couldn't blame her for entertaining the thought after a miserable start, which involved yet another crash in a 5,000 metre final. The worst, Christy says, she's ever seen. From there it was Struggle Street, the pain resurfacing when recalling those moments. Got crook, had a trip to hospital, uh, found out that I was unable to do the marathon and um, got an infection after that from being in hospital and um, was just pretty fed up and couldn't wait to get on a plane. It's a good thing she didn't leave early. This relay silver, her first medal after four Paralympic and one Olympic Games. Couldn't catch China, <laughs> but um, we got the Yanks and the Silvers to walk away with that. It's just amazing. Comments echoed by her husband and coach, who, much like at home, was by her side through it all. And the first few things happened, the crash, and then she got sick. You think, you know, you, you just think there's no... Uh, there's no justice out there, but then on the last evening of the track, they just did a superb job and it was, uh, it was fantastic. Lockyer's appearance before the Maitland local court this afternoon was brief, five minutes at most. Yesterday, though, his arrest followed a five-hour manhunt through Newcastle's outer western suburbs. Earlier that afternoon, a gunshot was allegedly fired on Kinter Drive, Beresfield, when a fight broke out among a group of men. With a suspected gunman on the loose, the police responded accordingly. Lockyer arrested just before 6pm and later charged with four offences. They include a fray, illegally possessing a firearm and using it in or near a public place. Court documents also allege the 32-year-old broke into the home of a Catholic sister and stole her phone shortly before his arrest. Today, Lockyer's defence solicitor, Michael Crozier, did not apply for bail. Magistrate Stephen Jackson requested that a brief of evidence be prepared before Lockyer's next appearance. The case has been adjourned to the Maitland Local Court on the 27th of October. Meanwhile, police continued to comb through bushland at Black Hill today, searching for the pistol. Adam McIlrick, NBN News. The Electoral Commission will formally declare Newcastle's new group of councillors tomorrow, but it appears only three members of the former council will make a comeback. Independent John Tate as Lord Mayor, his main rival Aaron Buman, and the Greens Michael Osborne. The new councillors belong to three distinct camps. There's the three-member Tate independent team, Aaron Buman's opposing independent team, also three strong. The largest single power base comes from Labor with four members. Then there's one Liberal, one Green and the only unaligned independent, Scott Sharp. One of only two women on the council, Labor's Sharon Claydon, says she'll be trying to resist the urge to play party politics. Councillors have to get over that. You're there to represent the people of Newcastle and that's what the focus is about. You know, if, if you continue to just, you know, stay in little blinkered boxes, then um, that's not good for Newcastle. Independent Scott Sharp, who runs a long-standing Newcastle nursery business, says he'll be voting according to his own set of values, but admits the political groups have already begun sounding him out. I have had conversations uh, with them, uh, but we haven't really discussed uh, you know, what we will do in, in particular situations. 
Paul Lobb, NBN News. You may not have a need for them anymore after upgrading the lens or choosing a new style, but your outdated spectacles or sunglasses are certainly not useless. Hunter Resource Recovery's Life Cycle Program has joined with the Lions Recycle for Sight organisation to collect glasses from 114,000 homes in Cessnock, Lake Macquarie and Maitland. So if you have an eye for recycling, just pop your specs into the yellow bin on special collection days three times a year. Certainly they can certainly be put to good use and um, you know, don't, uh, don't throw anything away and let the lines decide what's useful and what's not. They'll be cleaned and repaired, then packed away to be distributed to Africa, Asia and the Pacific Islands. We have a little over 300 glasses at the present time in the first week of the service, so we're quite happy with that. Uh, Lions Club International would like to uh, recycle 500,000 pairs annually across Australia. And that shouldn't be too hard to achieve. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, about 50% of the population wears spectacles and many have more than one pair. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. Can't wait to take him home and can't wait to see how Emily reacts around him. So um, it's going to be fun. Maybe a little bit sleepless during the night, but uh, it'll be good. First and foremost, you know, my family's the number one option and uh, you know, I'm going to do whatever's best for them. The stadium lease barn fight has been simmering for years, not days, but recent public comments from both the Newcastle Jets and Minister for the Hunter Jody McKay forced the Knights to defend their position today. Disappointed they'd been painted as a bad guy, they released figures showing that as a major tenant, they make up around 90% of the stadium's annual costs, spending $1.5 million in rent and upkeep to the Jets' 153000 last year. Please don't say that's a bad deal. It's a sensational deal. It's a great deal according to the Knights. I haven't seen any documents or any figures to be able to ascertain whether that's the case. The league club delivered those today, but what the Jets are really after is an even share of all stadium revenue streams and their own catering rights. But reaching an equitable deal here remains the major sticking point, with one man's fair arrangement, the other's raw deal. The model that they've got at the moment is a very good one and it's not going to get better. Well, the Jets seem determined to change it one way or another. Frustrated they weren't offered a chance to obtain the major leaseholder rights in the first place, this is an issue bound to simmer away for a while yet. I'd suggest to you if the Knights were not the major tenant that the stadium wouldn't have got 60 million and it wouldn't be in existence, it would be a white elephant. I, I can rest assured that uh, without Con Constantine, uh, I doubt that the funding would have been there. And funding remains a paramount issue at the Knights, so much so privatisation is set to be a popular talking point at their board meeting tomorrow night. Jim Callanan, NBN News.
Bruce McKenzie is only small in stature but larger than life when it comes to local politics. He was on the council from 1968 to 2000 before taking a break to concentrate on his business interests. But now, after a successful campaign, the 70-year-old is back with fire in his belly and wasted no time in putting council staff, including general manager Peter Gessling, on notice. I think the general manager has got to perform. He's got to pull his uh, troops into line and, uh, and remember who, who they're working for. They're working for the ratepayers of Port Stephens and I don't think the ratepayers of Port Stephens are getting a fair, a fair return for their money and the rates they're paying. Councillor McKenzie will stand for Mayor at next week's meeting. He hopes to replace outgoing Mayor Ron Swan, who failed to get the votes to keep his spot. Mr Swan plans to spend more time relaxing on the water, miles away from what he predicts will be a fiery new council. They're certainly going to be uh, rather volatile as far as personalities and politics are concerned, to a degree. Uh, I think it'll be very testing. Well, I think the best message you can get to people, the ratepayers of Port Stephens, is do something for them. Clean their drains out. Get back to basics. Give them some decent roads. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Two women and 11 men. The New Look Newcastle Council was officially announced this morning by the Electoral Commission. Some say they're ashamed of the previous council and have vowed to do better. And among their priorities, the sad decline of Newcastle's main street. If you have a look down the west end of the city, it's in a terrible state and we, we want to clean it up. Hunter Street is not good. We actually released a policy on the shops of shame during the campaign. Um, but I am inspired by Marcus Westbury's ideas. That's a plan to lease the empty shops to community groups free of charge to help reinvigorate the area. Independent Graham Boyd believes it's not all council's fault. He wants developers to take more responsibility. A council has an opportunity to get developments approved, doesn't have the, the opportunity to make developers develop. He's keen to find a way to stop empty buildings sitting dormant and derelict. So what we need to do is have a strategic plan that limits the advance of, of DAs to a point where they are being constructed as soon as they're approved. As for the tate Buman rivalry and party politics... We want to focus on um, getting communication and starting discussions with the people of Newcastle and I think that's more important than um, egos. It's the reason I'm involved with this council is that I really want to change a lot of the bad things. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. The State Emergency Service says from next week, the hunter can expect an increased likelihood of severe thunderstorms. The service says preparing your home in advance can help lessen the damage if wild weather hits. People should start to uh, carry out maintenance around their property, uh, look at clearing out uh, gutters, making sure there's no leaves or rubbish blocked in those, downpipes, uh, trees, go around their property, if any nearby trees that may be damaged, they need to start you know, looking after those and uh, doing any pruning that's necessary. To help people prepare, the SES has used a $50,000 state government grant to send out info packs to households in the Hunter. It contains advice on how to prepare your home and what to do if a severe storm strikes your suburb. Loose items that may be in the yard, they can be whipped up and uh, you know, used as a projectile into, uh, into the houses or into people. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
In looking back at his first season with Manly, Josh Perry recalls what he would have been doing this time last year. I was probably sitting at home with a dirty hangover, but um, you know, one one win out from a grand final, and you know, I'm loving life and, and loving footy. That wasn't the case when rounding out his career with the Knights. A bit emotional, but um, yeah, it's probably a good time to be leaving, I guess, if there any, is any. And while the 07 season couldn't finish soon enough, he doesn't want this year to end. It's been a massive year and um, I'm not ready to stop playing yet, so hopefully we've got a couple more games left in us and um, you know we can hold that trophy up at the end of the year. Should that be the case, it will cap off quite a season for the powerful prop, but not without sacrifice. It was a tough move at first, you know, leaving a family and friends and and, you know, I always thought I was going to play out my career at Newcastle, but, um, you know, coming here, it was the best move I could have made. And Thank goodness for YouTube. Otherwise, Karina Nowland's dad, Danny, would never have witnessed firsthand what he effectively paid for. I lent her the money back in March to go over and she was hoping just to qualify for some of the pro tournaments and uh, lo and behold she won four out of the five stops. Her last tournament in San Francisco at the weekend producing a world equaling record set 12 years ago. It was actually a great feeling. I'm actually still in shock. I'm still in San Francisco and uh, it, yeah it's just taken really 24 hours to absorb you know. This was her first year full-time on America's Pro Water Ski Tour and follows an injury plagued 2007, but what a turnaround. I've just had an exceptional year. I've gone from 15th in the world to number one, and it has been a struggle, but it's obviously paid off. But being the world's best means Karina is the one to beat and knows she'll be a marked woman when World Cup meetings roll around in November. The 21-year-old then returns for the domestic season, sharing her time between home and her base in Port Macquarie. Year 12 students at St Paul's Catholic High School at Burrigal had their moment of glory this afternoon as they were given a rousing send-off by the entire school. But last night, for many of the same students, it was a moment of shame. Eleven were taken into police custody after a rampage on the school grounds that involved as many as 100 students, some lighting signal flares, smashing bottles, spray-painting walls, setting off fire extinguishers and even assaulting police. As they were arresting one of the uh, female students, uh, one of the officers was uh, pelted with uh, eggs and water bombs as well. Uh, one of the other kids apparently was videotaping this at the time, so it was supposed to be a great lark, but we have confiscated that and uh, we'll be looking into that as well. Those arrested have been officially cautioned or warned by police who remain angry about the level of resources tied up. And having five police cars and three fire brigade tankers tied up to go and talk and deal with these kids I think is just becoming rather excessive. The Catholic school's office has condemned the behaviour. The school will, will take action in relation to those students who they find have um, you know, seriously breached the school rules. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
There's nothing like the drone of a dirt bike engine to shatter the serenity of a suburb. John Cahoon has been living at Cameron Park for eight years and is fed up with riders illegally using the lane next to his house to get to the nearby bush. It's loud and noisy and it's, it's irritating. You can, hear them, you can hear them going right out to Westy. He's written to Lake Macquarie City Council about getting bollards erected in the alley. However, they said it's an enforcement issue and should be reported to the police or rangers. But this matter isn't restricted to Cameron Park. It's one echoed across our very bushy region. The issue was raised at State Parliament earlier in the year and a working party formed. But according to a press release from Minister for the Hunter Jody McKay, that group hasn't met in nearly three months. That's cold comfort to people like John. If they lived next door to a laneway and had, had motorbikes going up and down it, they, they, there would be something done. Motorbike retailer Graham Boyd says the only way to solve the problem is to provide somewhere legal to ride. Obviously the bikes are unregistered and can't be registered, so they're, they, they're designed for off-road, so we need an off-road facility um, for the bikes to ride. Simple as that. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. Thanks to new technology, the collapsed section of the city's drainage network was caught on camera. Council workers discovered the damage following a routine inspection using CCTV. It's like a little uh, remote control vehicle and a camera mounted on that remote control vehicle and that travels down the drain. The survey found a leaking water pipe for the fire brigade was causing pressure and damaging the historic circular double brick culvert. Well, we're going to have to close the street because we're starting to see some surface depressions on the street, which means that the area that's uh, under the culvert is uh, starting to erode and the road is starting to collapse into the culvert. From tomorrow, Church Street will be partly closed and parking limited for two weeks while the problem is assessed. Meanwhile, Council has reached an agreement with the RTA and Hunter New England Area Health to complete a geotechnical investigation of New Common Street. A large and dangerous wall in the city street was damaged in last year's June storms and has been on the brink of collapse ever since. But it's expected repairs may not commence until mid-next year, meaning the road will remain partially closed for at least another the nine months. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. Like I said, there was awesome goals and there's opportunities to get into uh, apprenticeships, cadetships. As roads turned to rivers on the 8th of June last year, there were dozens of stories of people helping others. One involved Senior Constable Bruce Thornton and leading Senior Constable Stephen Young, who were today awarded for helping to save a teenage boy who was trapped on a flooded causeway in the Newcastle suburb of Maryland. We um, entered the water where the young fellow was snagged up against a tree uh, with the aid of a winch line and Senior Constable Young here, we were able to go into the water um, and unsnag him from the tree. He'd been in the water for a significant period of time. He was panicking from time to time and each time he'd panic he'd be going under and it was a matter of trying to support and hold him, um, keep his head up until we could actually get the ropes around him to drag him out. Also acknowledged was Inspector Dave Matthews who began the mammoth task of coordinating the storm response including the evacuation of sailors from the Pasha Bolka. And I think the toughest thing at the, at the onset was uh, coordinating everybody and getting everything up and running and just working out exactly what we were dealing with. And um, once we determined that, it was, it was quite good. Everything just fell into place. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Jets players wear this pink shirt when they've done something stupid, but Joel Griffiths wants to make a smart choice about his future, and ideally before they play Adelaide on Saturday. That's why I wanted to get it out of the way, and if I can get it, uh, if I can get it done, then I think it'll be best for not only myself but also the club as well. They can move forward. But it's understood that depends on what happens with twin brother Adam, whose contract is also up for negotiation. 
I think Joel is just about over the line, but we still have to deal with him signing the dollar line, number one, and deal with his brother, Adam Bruce. Nursing a corked thigh, the defender took training easy this morning, but is likely to take his place, while Edmundo Zura has a back complaint. It turned out it wasn't as nasty and he's had a cortisone to settle down the um, area where it was affected and uh, he won't play this weekend. Jasper Hawkinson, though, makes his comeback while Daniel Piakovsky keeps his spot, playing for his future beyond the eight-week injury waiver. It would be nice to sign for you know, a longer period of time, but um, I've just got to get out there and do the job. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. The next six to 12 months, we'll find out that the Knights have gone someone else in privatised. Will you have a game? Well, it depends on the time. It depends what, they, what they're looking for. I will still love to do a joint venture with them where both clubs go forward. Back at his Newcastle base, the outlook has a golden glow for Kurt Fernley, but it almost didn't happen. Our last gold medal at the Beijing Games was also Kurt's first, coming on the final day of competition. You know, the marathon was a dream run and it made everything worthwhile and everything made that marathon so much more special. And everything that could go wrong did. The biggest setback was in the 800 metre final where a mistake by officials saw him race in lane two instead of lane seven. But despite being given the option to rerun and pressure from Aussie officials to do so, Fernley settled for silver. I'm not a big fan of asking what could have or, or would have happened, but what happened happened and I'm, I'm pretty proud with how it went. No one more so than his coach. More outstanding than actually his medal performances. I think he, you know, he left, a, left as a real role model as a person as well as an athlete. With one gold, two silver and a bronze, Fernley rates these games as his best ever. But the year is far from over and would you believe it can only get better. Chicago and going back as defending champion and uh, that, I, I leave in two more weeks to, to head over there and New York, I'm going for three times in a row. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. Police swooped at a service station on the F3 at Tuggera on the central coast yesterday. The raid netting some significant results, cash and half a kilo of methamphetamine bound for Newcastle. They arrested 67-year-old Zivko Skopevsky, who was today described by police as a middle-sized player in the illegal supply of ice into the Hunter. You are certainly not dealing with the street level supplier. Zivko Skopevsky appeared briefly in Wyong local court this morning, facing five counts of supplying a prohibited drug. His defence did not apply for bail and it was formally refused. He's due to reappear in court in mid-November. The man police allege was next up the ladder, 74-year-old Sydney man Kevin Griffiths and 44-year-old Glebe woman Donna Upton, were both refused bail in Penrith court today in connection with the bust. These people are a bit, a bit older than what we normally deal with. Um, I think that it's also a lesson that we won't focus just on where you think drug supply might be occurring. All up, six houses in Newcastle and Sydney and a Hamilton restaurant were searched, with the two-month operation seizing one kilo of ice with a street value of $500,000. But police know the fight against ice is far from over. We would be naive to think that drug supply is going to stop from here on in. Penny Evans, NBN News. Hunter Water is planning a billion dollar spending spree with our money. The latest estimates suggest it'll cost $406 million to build the Tilligra Dam in the Williams Valley and there are plans to spend another $600 million on storm and waste water. Telegraph will be a major component at 
but more significantly we'll be spending more money than that on wastewater treatment plant improvements to make sure our beaches are safe for swimming and also our wastewater transport system. The bottom line for us will be higher bills. At the moment the average water bill is $718 a year but under the plan that would increase next year by $165 and then about $60 a year each year after that. So by the year 2012 your bill will be over $1000 a year and not everyone will be able to afford that. I think it's another blow for people on low incomes. They've already been struggling with higher electricity prices, higher fuel prices. Hunter Water has submitted its plan to the Independent Pricing Tribunal which will hold a public hearing in Newcastle on the 1st of December. It is a big increase and, and no one likes increases in bills but it's the time for Hunter Water to invest in infrastructure. Paul Lobb, NBN News. The school holidays hadn't even begun, but today thousands of students beat the bell and headed to Newcastle Beach. The lifeguards estimated more than 2,000 beachgoers, mostly kids, and they weren't just enjoying the sun, surf and sand. Brawls like this one occur several times a day, with lifeguards or a security guard forced to break them up. A lot of antisocial behaviour, uh, with a lot of the uh, kids coming from outlying areas, coming in in gangs and then uh, picking on each other. Uh, so there has been fights. For those catching the train from the valley and Lake Macquarie, Newcastle is the end of the line. It's also the closest stop to the beach. And according to the lifeguards, as the weather heats up, so does the violence. Littering, underage drinking and stealing are also ongoing headaches. They want a stronger police presence and more patrols. We find that if they've got a proactive presence down here, it does curb the behaviour of the children. As for advice to young beachgoers... Fighting's out at school, fighting's out at the beach. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. This was honeysuckle from the air in 1997, mostly disused waterfront land ripe for redevelopment. After countless delays, the former port and railway site slowly started changing shape a few years later. Fast forward 10 years, it's now undergoing rapid transformation and of course it's not finished yet. There's a lot of construction work still underway. Uh, we've got a couple of new buildings just about to open but uh, yes, we've still got a few years to get it right and get it completed but we're on track. And with more development comes more employment. A recent study conducted by the Hunter Valley Research Foundation found that Honeysuckle has already generated $1.3 billion for the economy and thousands of jobs in construction and professional services, including 2,000 in the private sector. The next stage of the Lee Wharf development is now full steam ahead, while new restaurants and the Maritime Museum are opening soon. But the lack of parking remains a problem. Our studies show that there's adequate parking at the moment. Uh, we're in, currently negotiating to purchase another site to build a parking station uh, near the restaurant precinct. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. Of the 260 land care groups in Lake Macquarie, 60 are now school-based and a green army of 200 students took part in today's land care greening day next to the Whitebridge end of the Fernley track. Land care coordinators are doing their best to keep the suburbs green by enthusing the next generation. It's critical and uh, Lake Macquarie is a, is a garden city isn't it? There's a lot of uh, natural bushland areas still here. A large number of our groups are looking after that natural bushland areas that keeps it that way. Um, you, know, you don't want to live in a concrete jungle, you want to live in a, in a garden. Um, that's what we're doing and that's what we're doing here today. And while playing in the dirt is fun, the big picture isn't being lost on the youngsters. Our environment is dying because of how many roads and Pacific highways are being built and we thought we'll, we'd come down and plant some more trees for the environment. We need trees for oxygen and if there's not enough trees you wouldn't be able to breathe. It just felt really good to have a positive effect on the environment. Just get out here, get your hands dirty and just do something for the community. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
Given the coaching merry-go-round of the Newcastle Jets, let alone rival A-League clubs, today's five-year commitment is unprecedented. But given the success of Gary Van Egmond and his assistant Mark Jones in just over two years in charge, it's viewed as just reward. The direction the club is, is heading was something which I felt uh, I definitely wanted to be part of. I think if we do it now, it sends a very strong message to the players, which is very important. Namely, Joel Griffiths, the A-League Player of the Year and fringe Socceroo striker is close to inking a similar long-term arrangement at the Jets. And today's news may be enough to seal the deal. I really hope so. Uh, there's no denying he gets on with myself and, and Mark very, very well. But the coaching appointments go further than that. The club is about to launch its youth team and later build an academy while the senior team heads into the Asian Champions League next year. We want to build something, we want to uh, ensure that football here at the Newcastle Football Club um, is going to keep progressing. And after the announcement, both coaches went straight back to work, joining their team for the long trip to Adelaide ahead of tomorrow night's game, no doubt appreciating the nuances of the club they'll be at for some time yet. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Both coaches had a good look at number one sports ground today, but it's blue sky overhead and the heat that comes with it, which may rule how this game is played. Either way, it's sure to favour university's open attacking style. It's supposed to be 30 degrees tomorrow, so we're definitely going to feel it. Stay in, in contention with them, not let them get too far away from us and hopefully those last 20 minutes will, will start to tell on them. Enjoying something of a renaissance in recent times, this is the third grand final for the students in six years. They hope this is the one that ends with the trophy. It's been 20 years since they've won a uh, premiership and uh, university, they, uh, they like to celebrate when they win. Hawks coach Scott Coleman would have retired last season save for the pain of grand final defeat against Merriweather and he doesn't hide from the fact it's driven a number of his players for one more season. Tomorrow's match is just his team's second in five weeks. That and a training mishap to reigning player of the year Va Talialiva has made for a disjointed preparation. If he's 50-50 we're going to start him anyway because he... You can't stop him really, I think I'm scared to say no to him. Either way, Hamilton will start favourites tomorrow. A busload of tourists from the Blue Mountains scoured the site today, just one of the many paying tour groups helping to cover the costs of maintaining the fort. The yeah, Historical Society need uh, some money, but of course all the money that's uh, raised here through the tours and that goes back to the council. After the federal government's $10 million renovation, volunteers are now scratching the pan for funds to upgrade surviving memorabilia and artefacts, with tens of thousands needed to restore one gun alone. They're hoping to get the museum open by the end of the year. I think we've had a fair whack from the federal government. Um, I don't know whether we'll get anything from the state government, but we'd like to uh, have independent people who might like to, uh, to, to give us some money to get these things back into shape again, you know. John's also keen to see the new multi-purpose centre open once council organises a development application. Aside from generating extra revenue, it will have another attraction. The biggest problem here at the moment is, is a lot of elderly people come up on the bus and they want to, the first thing they want to do is have a coffee because we can't supply. Since opening about six weeks ago, the volunteers have been astounded by the number of visitors pouring through the gates. However, so far it's been the interstate and even overseas sightseers that are outnumbering the locals. So we want to get them off their backsides and get them up here as well. Penny Evans, NBN News. I'm a Labor voter and always have been. Uh, I call on J.D. McKay to, to, to do something with that site. That's an absolute disgrace.
Hawks flank of Ard Talia Leva passed a fitness test in order to play, but Jan Zabowski's grand final didn't go past this tackle. Knocked out, he made an early exit. After winning a scrum against the feed, Hamilton followed up with the blindside raid from Damien Wells to find just enough real estate to score. David Kennedy got university's account going for the day. But it was Wells with all the right moves in the opening half. His kick and some help from the students saw Tim Walton over for a 13-3 lead. Uni's reply wasn't bad. Going wide, they found space and winger Ed Close, who was close enough as Uni moved back to within three. The students enjoying little respite though as the Hawks squeezed again, Walton waltzing over for his second. It was meant to be the Hawks who wilted in the heat, but on the stroke of half-time, Paul Crozier picked off some lazy defence for a 25-13 buffer. Hamilton's margin only grew after the break, thanks to Peter Maxwell. However, the students were never going to die wondering, Kennedy back amongst the action. While that man Wells proved hard to contain, as the Hawks looked every bit of team heading for the Premiership. One fan made an early exit. But the Hawks stayed the distance to send retiring captain coach Scott Coleman out a winner. We've got a route that's being introduced onto Hannell Street and up Honeysuckle. Uh, we've got a more direct service from Swansea, Charlestown and Belmont. It takes an olive tree about five years to bear fruit from the time it's planted and as an overall business, olive oil production in this country has come of age. We're now as an industry just ready to launch Australian Extra Virgin as our own identity to separate the fresh Australian oil from the imports. The main difference of course is price and growers say international standards are based on Spanish conditions. Our oils are not the same as Europe's. Imported extra virgin is cheaper because there's more of it made, but the Aussies are fighting back, buoyed by a 24-fold increase in domestic production over six years. Our own mills can produce much better, and we have been doing it for a number of years now, and we're now reaching that critical mass where we have enough really good olive oil to go around. Hunter Valley growers, most of them boutique, make up the biggest olive association in the country. They say Australians are left with little choice but to opt for imported produce because there's still not enough locally made oil to satisfy demand and therein lies the challenge. And so we have a terrific uh, opportunity here as Australian growers to do import substitution because from a quality viewpoint there's no doubt fresh is best. The Australian Olive Association will now develop a code of practice for the table variety. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. Arriving home late today, the Jets are sure to keep a range of medical services in business this week. A-League Player of the Year Joel Griffiths among them, after tearing his hamstring and forced to sit at least three weeks on the sideline. Now, a lot of people have written us off and you know they'll continue to write us off and... Um, you know, I just want to answer those critics and I can't do that while I'm watching. It came during a bizarre few minutes. 
Griffiths became tangled in a tackle which earned him a yellow card, but it was the searing pain that caused most concern. So is twin brother Adam, but he'd come off only minutes earlier. While Dane import Jasper Hawkinson lasted just inside the second half after a calf muscle problem proved too much for him. But it's Jason Hoffman's season which is now on the line after damaging his knee in this challenge. Scans will reveal the full extent of the damage but there's genuine fears he's headed for surgery. In worst case scenario, um, probably looking at six to eight months um, which is Obviously, you know, pretty devastating to hear. It left Newcastle with just 10 fit men, an advantage that soon proved irresistible for Adelaide. Fighting to the end, Tarek Elrich almost stole Newcastle a point. Now chancing their arm as they chased the result, it cost them at the death as Cristiano pounced at the back for Adelaide to add insult to injury on a horror night for Newcastle.